Yeah, good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, I think this is a, a kind of a treat because I took the opportunity to uh, take a bit of a pause and reflect about what we've learned about this idea of social learning uh, and how useful it can be for ag extension work. Um, so it was, it was very useful for me and, and hopefully for you as well. Um, okay, so what do we really mean when we say social learning? Right? Uh, what, you know, this concept is, is kind of nebulous, lots of referrals to peer effects, social diffusion effects, kind of lots of language about this idea, right? Uh, you know, and, and really what we're looking at are, are the people who are not themselves directly trained, right? So we're trying to capture this notion of indirect learning that is, you know, maybe it's social in the sense that it's happening via friends and, and family and, and kind of what we think about as social networks, but, uh, but maybe not. But, uh, you know, typically we think about these things as happening within the same geographic context, like a village or, or a local network. But sometimes we, we think about this happening, you know, across uh, space through family or kin connections, right, uh, in lots of different ways. Um, so, you know, I, in just kind of the way that I, I do this with, with um, students and with my kids and, and with other colleagues, I want to just take you through like a two-minute exercise, okay? <laughs> Grab your phones. You're allowed to take your phone out. You might already have it in your hands, in which case that's okay. <laughs> Grab your phones. Yeah. Okay. Now, turn to your neighbor, if you're, you know, or if you're maybe two neighbors, fi find someone else to talk to. And each of you gets one minute to tell your neighbor your favorite thing about your phone, the thing that it does best for you, the thing that causes you to love it, okay? The best thing about the phone. Okay, and then switch and do it in reverse. All right, go. You have two minutes. Two minutes. All right, that's about one minute. Now you have to switch. Now switch and listen to your other mate's version. First of all, I want you to notice how hard it is for a faculty member to give up the floor for two minutes and let you talk to yourselves, right? But uh, let me pose a question to you now. So on the basis of what you've just learned, how many of you would be willing to or interested in switching phones and buying or you know, finding your neighbor's phone instead on, that, on the basis of that conversation? Any interest? No, you're all, in fact, cemented in your own existing practices and behaviors, right? Despite our exercise here at Social Diffusion. Right? So, I mean, I, this is, you know, obviously a little bit of a toy example, but in some sense it really highlights this notion that we have people, agents, right, who, with deeply held beliefs who have, in fact, experimented and adopted a technology themselves, right, and are now communicating about it. And you can start to see all the different complications in that interaction, right? In some cases, you don't know each other super well, so your social network links may be, you know, super shallow, but, but in some cases, maybe they're, in fact, quite, quite strong. You know, you can see kind of differences uh, in, in kind of baseline beliefs, differences in, in kind of risking it, all sorts of things going on here, right? And, and you could see how all of those factor into this. And in the end, we get zero adoption, and, and we go home and... and uh, 
try to write papers about it. <laughs> so the striking thing is right, right, that over the last quarter decade, I'm sorry, quarter century, uh, there has been kind of a raft of work documenting this kind of social learning in lots of different settings, right? Across the world, across, and especially in, in, in ag, but, but also in lots of other uh, non-ag settings, right? Including labor markets in developing countries, health insurance uh, take up, um, nutrition behaviors, microfinance take up, right? Lots of very different settings in which we are documenting real social learning, right? And, and I mean real here, not, and we'll get to this too, but not just in the sense of kind of mimicry and, and imitation, but, but actually kind of learning about the techniques and the practices in, in a deeper way um, that, that's happening. Um, and what's interesting is when you start to kind of unpack what the learning is really about, you can start to kind of tease out uh, a number of different facets, right? And, and I think you probably started seeing this again in your kind of interactions just, just now. Now, part of this is about the benefits of the technique, right, or the technology or the behavior, right? What does it get you, right? What's the, what's the, the, the big thing, the big reason for doing it? A part of it that, uh, you know, is really about how you do it, right? What's the method for actually implementing this thing, right? Um, you know, maybe, maybe one of the reasons that you recommended your phone is because it has this really cool app that does something super useful for you, right? But, but maybe it sounds a little complicated to your neighbor to actually try to figure that out in their own context. Um, and so, you know, probably in that minute you didn't spend a lot of time saying, well, this is how you, this is how you actually use this particular app, which might be a barrier for, for some folks. Um, and then the downsides, right, are also things that I explicitly didn't ask you to talk about the downsides in that snippet, but, but they're, of course, important, both in terms of the actual costs of adopting the behavior, but also, of course, the risks associated with it. And, and um, what's interesting, right, is that some of these are what we think about as hard information, right? They're directly observable or, or more directly observable, and some much softer and less directly observable information. Um, and the degree to which those things are true ends up really, I think, as we've learned, kind of governing the extent of, of social diffusion. Um, so obviously it's a lot easier to communicate information if you can point to an example right there and then, right, that documents that gain in, in yields or that reduction in uh, risk or the, the added resilience, right? But other things are much harder to, to show. The other thing is that the observability also governs kind of how much of this mimicry you might get, right? How much you get people just seeing you doing something and doing it because they're seeing you do it versus that kind of deeper learning that we talked about, what are the, the true benefits, the true costs, right? And, and those things uh, end up looking quite different. Um, you know, this, this literature that I, that I referenced before documents quite a bit of mimicry, but, but, but more limited of, uh, examples of this kind of deeper learning. Um, there's also a component that I think is often overlooked uh, that is really trying to understand the incentives of the people who are in fact communicating, kind of the initially trained people, the disseminators, the communicators. Um, obviously I'm standing before you today and I'm trying to communicate something to you and, and I've come here on, under my own incentives. Right? not being paid lavishly to, to be here, that's probably figured out. Um, and yet I have my own incentives for doing that, right? Um, often, I think we kind of overlook that set of incentives. Um, we overlook it on a number of dimensions. First of all, there is a lot of what we think about as learning by doing for these initially trained folks. Um, and that learning by doing really kind of creates complementarities between someone's own adoption and their ability to effectively communicate to their neighbors and friends and social networks, all those things that we just talked about. Um, and of course, that learning by doing, that adoption is also a hard signal in some sense, right? It is, it's an observable signal in some settings that this thing really is useful, right? That it's not just kind of cheap talk that I'm offering you that's, oh, I heard about this great thing and oh, I haven't had a chance to try it myself, but I heard it's great, right? Versus, no, yeah, look, it's doing all this great stuff for me. Um, and then the other piece that we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, with, some, with some colleagues and uh, is really, and, and run a bunch of experiments on this, is what are the, um, you know, 
the, the identities and, and the kind of status and roles of these initially trained people, how does that affect their ability to communicate um, externally, right? So um, especially when these, the returns and the costs to the adoption are variable across the population. So some people are gonna really benefit from this thing and some people less so. And then some people are also gonna face particular challenges in adopting it. Um, you know, if it's a new way of planting, you know, people who have the kind of tools and assets and labor access to, to try that out are going to have a much easier time, right, than others. And so they're going to learn from adoption from, and, and learn, sorry, from communication from different types of people as well. So that identity ends up kind of really mattering and the relevance of the information ends up, ends up really mattering. Um, but I, I want to kind of offer an, an, a puzzle that we've kind of, I, I think, reached in, in this literature, which is that as we've documented all these cases of social learning, right, and we've kind of identified it in so many contexts that you think about it as being quite common and widespread, right, why don't we see this then happening kind of in the wild, like in, you know, with, without us having to focus on it and come together to talk about it, right? Why don't just more things that ag extension agents and, and ag extension efforts do more regularly, why don't they just catch on through this process, right? And we've documented it in all these different ways. Um, and, and so that's kind of, I think, the really interesting point for right now and for research and also, I think, for, for practitioners to try to think about how we maximize this and where, what, we, what we know and don't know about um, where this works and doesn't. Um, so one aspect that I think we really have just kind of touched the surface on is this role of incentives for the initially trained people to communicate externally. Right? Most programs essentially think about these guys as volunteers, right? They're, they're meant to communicate externally. Uh, sorry, batteries running low. Let's hope we make it through. Uh, they're meant to communicate externally based on their own um, interests, right? So they, they may be like intrinsically motivated, like they really believe in, in spreading the word, or they themselves have benefited greatly from the technology themselves. So they're kind of what we think about as true believers. Oh, well, that was an easy fix. Thank you. Um, but when that's not the case, uh, when we're trying to get people who maybe haven't had, haven't seen the big returns yet, or um, aren't necessarily like having having the time and altruism to go out there and spread the word, right? We need to think seriously about incentives. Um, so, what kind of incentives can we offer these otherwise volunteers? Right? Um, naturally, you might think about some kind of performance-based incentives. Maybe they're kind of some some version of in-kind rewards. Um, and we've tried different variants of these and, and uh, with varying success. So maybe at kind of the early stages, you award these guys based on the spread of information alone, right? Just kind of capturing how much other people in their villages or networks know about the technique that they're trying to, to, to educate about. And then over time, you start to measure, right, how that translates into a to take up an adoption among the other folks. We figured it out. Uh, I probably stepped on the plug and it came out. Thank you. Um, and then in the very longer term, you can start to incentivize actual outcomes. Right? But notice these also lead to very different types of behaviors. Like if you only incentivize information spread, right, people are going to find the nearest person that they can most easily talk to. Right? If you incentivize adoption, people are going to start to go a little bit farther. Right? But then there might also be cases, especially if the returns are variable, that they're willing to convince somebody to adopt it even if it's not helpful to them, right? They're not gonna, the, the, the communicators and disseminators aren't gonna worry about whether this is a good thing for you necessarily, they're just gonna try to get you to do it, right? And then of course outcomes, which is what you really want, right? You want them to find the people who will benefit the most from this particular technique, right? But that's of course long term. And then you're asking these guys to do a different thing, right? Which is actually learn about the returns, not just to themselves, but to the potential uh, audiences, members, right? So these are all kind of very different flavors. We found that they work reasonably well if you put them together and try to sequence them kind of logically for people. 
So maybe after the first season, you're just rewarding some, t some discussion and information spread. A couple of years later, adoption and outcomes, right? Um, and so this really, whether, which of these to incentivize really depends on how much heterogeneity there is in the population and how much time it takes to actually observe adoption and, and take up, right? Um, so that's, that's the particular case, you know, that, that we had in Malawi where we randomized um, these kind of incentives and, and did it over a sequence of seasons. Um, it seemed to work reasonably well. But, you know, this is a technique that, um, that we were promoting that, that actually seemed to benefit most farmers. So we weren't asking these, these um, communicators to necessarily go out and find the, the small number of people who would really benefit from this. Um, another role of incentives is to really try to push that communication out <clears throat> to the farthest reaches of the social network. Right? So, as I said before, if you just incentivize communication, just talking, and, and reward people who are kind of the initially trained, who tend to be the most central people in, in networks, you're going to get a little bit of, of push out, right? but not to the edges. And it's really only when you start to reward really large amounts of communication that you get to see this kind of, um, of discussion. So this is a, a really nice paper that did this in, in the context of health insurance in India, um, right. documenting how, how this kind of uh, push happens. There is, of course, some risk. Right, that the, by converting people's uh, intrinsic motivation for dissemination into like ex externally motivated, right, you're undermining their credibility because people know that they're being paid to tell you this thing, right? I'm not being paid to tell you any of this so you can believe everything I have to say, right? Um, but, you know, there are some hard signals available to, to the um, communicators to kind of counterbalance this. Look, it's good for me. Look, I, I've done it myself. The, the kind of, um, you know, hair club for men, I'm not only the, the president and the CEO, I'm also, you know, a customer, that kind of idea, right? Um, but th this is certainly something to watch out for, especially when the kind of availability of these rewards is very widely known and, and kind of, um, you know, this varies a lot by local context. Um, so I, I want to kind of challenge you to think about um, how to use social learning um, and, and how to maximize the kind of flow of social learning by targeting extensions slightly differently. None of this is, you know, uh, hard and fast rules. These are just kind of, again, I would say kind of first, first challenges. Um, so extension, when we talk about it, really, it's really kind of a mix of agent-based and farmer-based, um, and, and obviously different programs rely on, on those different agents differently. Um, where we do see farmer-based models, they tend to be what we think about as lead farmers, right? people who are self-selecting in and thus are more willing to experiment and typically are better educated, slightly better off than, than the rest of the population there. right? But these farmers might not be the most relevant to learning among the rest of the population, especially if there are skills, assets, um, you know, labor access, other complementarities right, which vary across the population. Um, if that's really the case, then the learning that the audience is going to do, the kind of recipient of that information, is going to be maximized when they're learning from people who are like them or who have similar levels of access or maybe even less access to them. Right? Um, so like my kind of canonical example for this is, you know, again, going back to the, the cell phone world, if my super techie, nerdy friend tells me about this great new app that they're using, right? I'm going to be like, oh, that's really cool, but probably not trying it out yet because they're at the leading edge of the vanguard and they figured this out and it's taken them a lot of other time and effort to figure out how to use this thing, right? Whereas when my mom tells me about, <laughs> right, this great new app, no, no knocks on my mom, but she's not necessarily the mo most tech savvy person in the world, uh, then I'm like, oh, well, this has got to be easy to use. I can pick it up right now. Let's just crank it out. Right? And, and so that's kind of the same idea, right? And this notion that the costs vary across, and my costs, you know, may be more similar to my mom, maybe they're just in the middle of the distribution, but if the costs are low enough that my mom can adopt it, they're certainly low enough that I could do it, right? Um, so that means focusing the training, though, on a different set of farmers, not necessarily lead farmers all the time, right? And, and again, not a hard and fast rule, but, but a push to, to move into more representative populations. Yeah. Um, 
On the other hand, of course, lead farmers have self-selected in for a reason, right? So they're more willing to experiment and have the ability to withstand shocks if the particular technology doesn't work out and, you know, are, are there for a reason. So you might need to compensate those more representative peer farmers, right, both for their own adoption, their kind of willingness to experiment, um, and for the communication, right? And, and that's a, a very different type of kind of incentivization and, and rewards. Um, let's see if I can speed through this. Um, let's think about targeting extension now, not just at the kind of individual level, but also at kind of higher levels of aggregation, right? So um, you, we might think about this as just picking out people, but then you might think about, okay, maybe we could just focus on clusters or villages at a whole or, or even regions, right? And the degree to which, of course, you want to focus on these different levels depends on how much interaction and complementarity there is between those efforts, the social learning efforts of people in those levels, right? So um, one big reason for potential complementarities among uh, agents, right, is that we don't always just believe the first thing we hear. Right? Um, sometimes it takes us multiple signals to start to draw an aggregate kind of estimation of the distribution such that we sufficiently believe that signal. Right? If that's the case, right, then we need to hear about a technology or a behavior from multiple people. Right? And that suggests that it's better to cluster that initial training to people who are otherwise close to one another in a social network such that, thank you, that they communicate to the same people that information, right? That a particular person gets exposed to signals from multiple sources at the same time, right? That, that suggests kind of a much more targeted and clustered approach. There's also some level of, of actual interaction among the trainees, not just that they kind of hit the same people with messages, but that they may actually benefit from collaboration in some, in some degree, right? Um, whether that's coordination, like, okay, I'm going to talk to these guys, you guys talk over here, or if it's actual collaboration in the adoption of, of the practices, um, some kind of mutual insurance, um, and, and um, other kind of approaches. And we, we've kind of explored this in, in a paper, trying to look at these different models, if you will, of social learning. Um, to what degree is social learning, for example, among maize farmers in, in um, Malawi, to what degree is it, what we think about is this kind of simple exposure idea where I just need to hear about it from one person. Maybe, you know, they just tell me enough or maybe I can see it from them, but that's enough to try to, you know, move the needle versus I'm, I'm one of these more kind of um, cautious people, I need to get it from multiple signals, right? And we tried to do this by basically measuring these social networks super carefully in, in, in 200 villages and then using these randomly uh, assigning villages to, to be kind of dis diffused through this simple versus more complex learning models. And we use the learning models to try to predict who the optimal initially trained people would be, right? And not surprisingly, the simple models suggest kind of if you want to maximize adoption in a whole network, you put people who are fairly central but kind of opposite each other, more like poles in, in a uh, network, because they'll each get kind of their own region of the village or their own cluster in the village, right? um, kind of diffused and, and learning, versus if it's a more complex kind of world, we really end up targeting. And maybe we only get a part of the village, but we get adoption in that part of the village versus nothing throughout the entire village. And that exercise really let us also then kind of back out at, at the end, what share of the population is using this kind of simple learning versus more complex learning styles? And, and actually we find it's, it's kind of half and half. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting insight that, that, you know, if anything, you want to average this and, and kind of mix what you're doing, but, um, but, but that there is definitely some degree of complementarity and, and some more kind of this complex learning that has to happen. So simply, even if you want to target a more representative population, just targeting them at random isn't, isn't going to do the trick. Um, and then the last thing I just want to talk about is, is well, two things. Uh, gender dynamics uh, play heavily into all of this. Of course, um, lots of differences um, in uh, kind of roles all throughout the communication process, so both in ability to, to initially adopt and kind of their role as, as initial trainees uh, varies for, for, for across genders. 
so do many of those complementary skill sets and assets and everything that I just discussed about kind of the relevance of the learning. Um, and then also the kind of social perceptions and attitudes that govern their ability of, of people of different genders, like men and women, to, to communicate. Um, so we experimented with this. Florence, who, who was here yesterday, uh, was, was part of this experiment. Uh, and what we learned, you know, we assigned some villages to be women trainees, some villages to be um, a, a mix, uh, mostly men, but a mix. Uh, and the women trainees learned about the technology as well or better than the men trainees, um, but were perceived by the other villagers to be less knowledgeable, even though we had documented in our own testing of them that they were more knowledgeable, right? And as a result, they had to exert more effort to compensate for this kind of discounting that happened. Um, and in the end, they achieved the same knowledge and adoption gains among the rest of the village. So on average, there were no differences in adoption. What was hidden behind those right, was the additional effort costs that these female trainees had had to exert to get there. Right? And these come at real cost. We kind of document that the fact that they had to spend a lot more time and effort doing this um, comes at real cost to, to them and their, their families and, and villages. Um, OK, the last thing I'll leave you with is just some open questions that I think are going to big, meaty subjects for research in this arena. Um, first of all, nearly everything that we've looked at has been at the individual or household level. We've not really dug into technologies or behaviors that have large spillover and externalities. Um, you can imagine that that heavily complicates this idea of who you were initially trained in the first place, but also the learning models get much, much more complicated. But that's, I think, a very logical next step. Um, lots of efforts to, to, to try to find simple proxies, simpler proxies, for social network position, right? So whether that's kind of a status estimate or, or maybe it's kind of like who, who's the most central distributor of information, like maybe they're the gossip, right? The, the person who, who spreads information, maybe it's kind of loose, soft information, but it's information, right? Lots of, uh, maybe it's the people who are in a most geographically centered in the village, literally live in the village center or kind of in those areas. Lots of attempts to, to identify which of those proxies work best for identifying um, the, the characteristics I've talked about. And then I think the other really big thing, and the reason I, I think it's useful to have lots of people in the room, is that a lot of what we're seeing is that the behaviors and the extent of social learning depend on how variable the returns to the technique are within a village or within a, a small group, right? and how variable are the costs. And to really get at that, we need um, lots and lots of studies of this. Um, because most of these studies are constrained to one, maybe two techniques or technologies at a time. Right? And, and those are, are happening in very different contexts. Um, so, so more work kind of documenting what happens as the benefits kind of shrink to a, a small subset of people in a village. Say if you're trying to do some screening exercises, like health screening, and you're trying to find the people who are most at risk of X, TB, for example. Um, you know, that's a very different exercise than spreading information about something that everybody could use, right? And so your the different roles are quite different. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm um, happy to chat more about this afterwards. Thanks. I can just take one round of sort of burning questions, um, and then uh, after that we'll move on to the, the rest of the panel. All right, let's start with uh, Richard in the back. Excuse me, Richard. Okay. Hi, Ben. Uh, I'm Richard Caldwell from the Gates Foundation. And to give you some context, I manage a tie, so very familiar with yep. the research. Um, two questions. One is, what are your thoughts around the external validity of, of this research in social networks? And the second question is, um, you know, much of the research shows really positive, you know, effects, and it's pretty exciting. But then when you think about how do you scale? So I'd like to get maybe your thoughts on scaling and the cost of this type of, uh, of work. Yeah, that's great questions. Uh, so I think the external validity, to be honest, is, is all about this, at the, this last bullet point, right? So how much the particular things we're promoting, how much they vary within villages. This seems to be a really big determinant of the extent of social learning that, that happens. Um, 
And so I think, you know, trying essentially kind of similar techniques that have different degrees of variability within different contexts. So in, in one village, this might be a good idea for everybody. In another village, this might be a good idea for half the people. In another idea, this might be a good idea for only a very small number of people. That'll teach us a lot about how this, you know, generalizes. I think this is a really important degree of, of um, heterogeneity and kind of the, the overall returns to this thing. The scaling, I think, is really all about this idea of simple proxies, both for the network positions, but also for the network characteristics, right? So we're not going to, we're not, we're not suggesting everybody goes in and does village censuses of all the networks and asks everybody in the village who they talk to before you do any extension work at all. Um, but there are kind of new efforts to get these kind of village level uh, networks from much, much shorter kind of uh, survey work. So you can ask a very small subsample of people a different kind of question about how many, how many people they know that have X characteristic and kind of recover this. Some new work on, on that stuff. The two of these things together, I think, really help on the scaling thing. Um, so that, that's where, that's where I'm, I'm hoping to put my money. At least. Okay. Very quickly, this is David Chulumbather from FAO. Uh, I'm just thinking what this is different from good old farmer to farmer learning. And, you know, if I talk to farmers in, in uh, many countries, they would say my neighbor farmer or another farmer is their first point of reference and information. And so then this is one thing. And second thing is word of mouth is good old way of spreading the news. It's the best way to, you know, pass information around. and. So also, I'm not studying social network or social learning as such. It seems to me, uh, you know, something which is already there and long, and it's just new outfit for what's been there for ages, forever. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Karin Lyon from Digital Green. Uh, I think this is fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, your example about having a tech savvy friend recommending something really complicated and you're like, no way, actually made me think if I had a tech savvy friend who recommended something so simple and that's what they were using, I would way buy into that. And I'm wondering, is there a concept in social learning around that? And if how could that be applied to ag extension? If you have thoughts, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh I think on this just idea, it, it definitely is, I think, this idea of word of mouth and farmer to farmer learning and the, the same ideas are around. Uh, I think the, the puzzle for us now is how to, how to harness that, right? We know that it exists. We can document it, right? The question is how do we get them to spread information that we're trying to get to them, right? And that's the part that where the hitch seems to be much more frequently, right, is that, in fact, there is some disconnect that happens between the initially trained people and their neighbors and friends and the people they talk to regularly such that that information never turns into take up or adoption right, by the, that second group. If, you know, we, we would see everything we do in the extension world spreading like wildfire if, if it was just a matter of unleashing word of mouth. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, um, there's definitely something there. Um, yeah, on this idea of, of um, and the tech savvy friend, I, I definitely use it, I think, in, in that particular context to think about the costs of adoption and the complementary skills uh, that are necessary for it, right? Um, another way to think about it, right, is the, the kind of validation exercise that happens, right, where maybe the returns are to this thing are really uncertain, and what your friend is is an expert who helps weed and select information, right? and only passes to you or filters to you information that they have already validated basically as an expert, right? Um, that, that definitely happens all the time too. Uh, it's, it's a bit different of an exercise, right? Because what you're really wanting to equip those initially trained people then, right, is with some sense of kind of certification and some way to credibly say, like, we've filtered this out. We've looked at all of these dozens of alternative apps, and this is the one that works, right? Um, otherwise, it's a, it, you know, it, it can still be very cheap talk, right? There's no way to really necessarily tell unless you've observed 
that your friend really does a good job, right? It's, it's like the reason why you go to the trusted critic sites and not just the first Google hit on like what kind of, I don't know, what laptop should I buy, right? You go to the, to the trusted sites because they filtered, but you need that kind of extra layer of validation, typically because they've listed for you everything else they've considered or they have some credentials or something else. Um, but it's a very different exercise than, than I think, kind of in, inferring costs. Yeah, so thanks again. Uh, thank you, Ariel, for that very, very good presentation. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how to translate evidence into policy when it comes to behavior change communication and health and nutrition. Uh, throughout my remarks, I'll refer to and draw on projects that IFPRI has been involved in in South Asia. However, there are similar interventions that are being conducted by governments and organizations throughout the world. And what I say applies to them more generally, and not just to health and nutrition, but really what I'm speaking about could be applied to ag extension, extension in, in education and health and nutrition and everything. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, behavior change communication is now being used as an intervention in all kinds of development programs in inducing farmers to change or adopt agricultural practices, like Ariel mentioned in his presentation, in improving credit and savings behavior, in inducing people to make better educational choices, and especially in improving um, the adoption of health and nutrition related practices. In health and nutrition especially, there is by now a large volume of literature that speaks to the very promising positive impact that BCC can have in improving health outcomes. The broad consensus is that BCC alone also works, especially for easily modifiable practice such as hand washing, for example, um, and also especially works well in participatory settings. But we can potentially see stronger impacts if BCC is coupled with other transfers. Here's an example. The Transfer Modality Research Initiative uh, was a large-scale RCT conducted in Bangladesh uh, with IFPRI and in partnership with the World Food Program. The intervention was targeted towards women who had young children, uh, and was structured as a cash and or food transfer uh, experiment, but had two arms that also had these transfers coupled with intensive BCC. Both short and medium term impact evaluations show that effects on health and nutrition related outcomes were stronger when BCC was involved. These eff effects extend to outcomes which are beyond nutrition. For example, the team finds that it induced strong and positive impact on the intervention. Uh, the intervention had a strong and positive impact on lowering intimate partner violence uh, only in cases where BCC was also involved. Now, while TMRI is a perfect example of how BCC can be used to complement other policy interventions, implementing such a pro uh, program at scale would require very strong political will and huge resource allocation. So in the absence of such uh, comprehensive programs, how has BCC been used in government interventions? And more importantly, why should we care? Well, we should care because BCC is forming a large part of many government and, social, uh, government and civil society-led interventions, particularly in India, um, where there is reliance. And so in India, for example, there is a reliance heavily on these development agents, most of whom are drawn from within the community for last mile delivery of services and behavior change communication. There are, for example, the Asha and Anganwadi workers in nutrition, uh, Pashu Sakhis or animal friends who are being used uh, to extend livestock related uh, information and extension and advisory. And then there are the farmer friends or the Kisan Salakars who are used for agriculture extension. Uh, many of these programs are leveraging the power of the collective by using self-help groups uh, to, de to deliver interventions. Part of the reason is that learning is assumed to be better when it's done in a group setting, an example perhaps of social learning. And also because self-help group members have often have access to these microloans. So by giving them information in a setting where they have access to resources to also act on that information makes for more effective uh, extension. Uh, so these are a couple of programs that IFPRI has evaluated that rely heavily on BCC, particularly in group settings. There is Jivika, which is run by the Government of India in partnership with the World Bank, and um, an evaluation of their BCC component by IFPRI has found that the that 
behavior change communication, health and nutrition has led to improvements in dietary diversity, both for women and children. Um, Care India, which is a large international NGO, um, has two projects called Pathways and Tarina that run in the Indian state of Odisha, where they have um, channeled BCC through uh, village groups and self-help groups, and we find that they, it had led to improvements in production and consumption diversity. Uh, the final project, which is WINGS, which is done in collaboration with a large Indian NGO called Pradhan, has again um, used self-help groups to uh, extend BCC to reach women and children. Uh, and they, like, they are trying to study the impact not just on nutrition, but also on women's empowerment. And as we speak, sort of preparations are underway to do end-line data collection. Uh, so most interventions that we talk about in the context of BCC stress on improving the content and the delivery modality of BCC. Uh, in a more recent project that I've been involved in, we set out to answer a slightly different question, which is that apart from the message, how does the identity of the messenger uh, matter for information retention and adoption? Now, there's growing evidence, uh, like Ariel also spoke about, that there is uh, that shared identity impacts behavior and responses in field experiments, in surveys, etc. Um, this is even more pertinent issue when it comes to, say, uh, interventions that are targeted through self-help groups, which tend to be sort of ethnically homogenous. So in the context of India, they tend to be caste homogenous because women self-select into groups. People in ha uh, ha habitations are sort of caste homogenous, which is why self-help groups also tend to be caste homogenous. And, and caste, for example, in India is a particularly important issue because it's an identity that continues to dictate a person's access to or lack of access to public goods and services. So this is something that we should be considering. In this context, the question we want to ask is whether the identity of the agent who is sent to deliver information or BCC or services, whether it, the, the fact that if it is in conflict or aligned with that of the group, would that matter in determining an intervention's success? Uh, we use a multi-treatment arm, uh, a multi-treatment lab and field experiment in West Bengal, state of India, to test A, how the provision of information affects an individual's nutrition knowledge and willingness to contribute to a club good, and B, how this effect is mediated by the caste identity of the information provider. Ariel, this speaks to your work on how social identity of the communicators and peer farmers influences others' learning and adoption. So, like I said, two cross-randomized treatments, the provision of information and the caste identity of the information provider. This table shows just a quick distribution of our treatment arm. We interviewed um, over 2,200 uh, women, over 240 self-help groups. Now, we use willingness to contribute to la in labor hours to a club good, which is kitchen gardens, because this is a concept that women were familiar with. Pradhan, the, our implementing partner for this intervention, was routinely eliciting willingness to contribute to various group-based activities. So this is not a concept that was completely alien to them. Um, among the two gas groups, we chose to have other backward casts as high and ST, which is scheduled tribes, as low. Uh, and the reason for that is even though both uh, the constitution recognizes other backward castes and STs both as being sort of lower on the caste hierarchy. In this region, at least, OBCs were widely accepted to be placed higher in the caste hierarchy compared to the tribals. Uh, and this is true both in this region as well as in generally uh, because the constitutional safeguards for tribals are much stronger than they are for OBCs, for example. So this was a sort of recognized and accepted um, placement in the caste hierarchy. Um, before the experiment, we trained our um, agents extensively in the BCC content in order to standardize message delivery quality. So we didn't want anything to be determined by the way they were delivering the message and the quality of the message. So we tried to minimize this as much as we could. Uh, the BCC content motivated the problem of health and nutrition uh, and the way that kitchen gardens could help in providing access to sort of a more diverse diet and, and then hopefully lead to better health outcomes. Uh, following this, the idea of constructing a, a group-based kitchen garden was, was um, introduced. Uh, this was followed by a willingness to contribute game, which was done in private uh, without consulting other group members, and this was followed by an exit interview. We tried to make this incentive compatible in that we were, they were told that a subgroup of randomly selected self-help groups will actually get a group kitchen garden, which will be facilitated by IFPRI and Pradhan. So what do we find? We find that BCC led to an increase in nutrition knowledge retention, but it didn't have any impact on willingness to contribute because baseline knowledge was already quite high in that group. 
But we do find that caste does have a strong and measurable impact. High caste, agent, high caste agents uh, elicited a higher willingness to contribute, regardless of which group they were matched with. Uh, on the other hand, uh, knowledge retention was higher when the agent was from a lower caste. What does this mean for program implementation? Unfortunately, it is not feasible, nor is it desirable, um, to send agents who are from the same caste as the groups that are being targeted, or agents who are always from the high caste, right? Uh, so we wanted to test whether there are modifiable attributes uh, that could offset the non-modifiable caste effect. Uh, and encouragingly, we find that soft skills, such as agents' confidence and clarity in explaining concepts, did lead to a higher willingness to contribute. We also find that group cohesion uh, and groups that are in groups that have been together longer are more willing to contribute labor hours regardless of which agent they were paired with, which means that we need to invest in training these extension workers, and we may want to target groups that have been in existence longer uh, just so that we can elicit stronger uh, effects. I'd like to end by summarizing sort of three key elements that we must consider when implementing BCC in nutrition, but like I said, this is extendable to other kinds of interventions as well. Maybe we need to think about ways in which we can layer, uh, leverage already existing institutions such as village groups uh, to layer BCC onto. Um, there is a need to explore ways in which BCC could complement other programs and transfers because there seem to be uh, stronger positive effects when we do that. And finally, probably need to be cognizant of the ways in which the identity of the BCC provider could mediate these impacts that we are hoping to achieve. All right, thank you. visual aids because I don't have any slides for you. Um, this is this is a, a, a great setup. Thank you to both of you. Thanks for coming. Oh, sorry. I'm, gonna, yeah, take I'm just going to get this because you're like idea. seeing yourself. <laughs> yes, don't <laughs> on I. The film. Hello? Okay, there we go. Um, so my name's Anna Marie Ball. I work with Harvest Plus. Harvest Plus works in that nexus between agriculture and nutrition. And the way that we do that is through what we call biofortification, which is breeding staple crops to have higher levels of micronutrients. So that's vitamin A, or when you're breeding it's beta keratin, zinc, and iron. Um, I'm not going to spend more time talking about Harvest Plus. If you want to know more, please go to our website. There's, it's a treasure trove of the evidence around biofortification, the tools that are there, stories of, of what's been happening in the field. Um, for my remarks today, um, I will refer to uh, the work that was done with the first of the biofortified crops that, were, that was ready to go out to farmers. And, um, for which I was I was brought in as the team leader as a behavior person, strangely enough on a on a what I saw as a as an agriculture um, project. But um, in fact, when you do this kind of work, you actually do have to look at the fact that this is behavior change at all levels. So. Um, the first research was done um, in Mozambique and, and in Uganda. Um, it was implemented by partners in the field, heavily researched, as is the, the, um, the practice in IFPRI. Uh, I often say it was the most over-researched project I will ever be involved in. But uh, for that reason, there is a lot of, of literature um, that, that is already published. The second project, which was only in Uganda, looked at uh, farmer diffusion and was, was influenced by um, um, a social network study uh, done by Scott McNiven. And in that, so I should say the first, the first study played around with levels of, of extension int intensity that was complemented by community level interventions and then mass media. And then the, the second big study was, was looking at diffusion and using the farmer group as the, as the control 
and then playing around with saturation levels of seed distribution in the community, one at 25%, one at 50%, and then another arm where we used opinion leaders and progressive farmers um, for seed distribution and for, for information. So all published, please read that. What I want to do is to try and distill some of the learning over 15 years of working in the field. Um, so first of all, the overarching premise of biofortification is to do as little behavior change as possible. So you're looking at taking a staple crop that somebody is already growing, already eating, and you're just switching a variety. Good. The problem is, if you take a sweet potato and you change it from white to orange, that's a pretty small example of a sweet potato patient, so <laughs> certainly not acceptable in Uganda. You take a maize and you turn it from white to orange, you really better be able to explain to your farmers what you've done. And this is where the behavior change at a different level comes in because you do have to talk about nutrition. And, and um, so we know that when you, when you modify a behavior, it's easier. When you create a new behavior, it's much harder. Um, so what we did when we changed the color of the, the crop, and the, so this is three, three crops, the sweet potato, the maize, and cassava. Cassava doesn't have quite a brilliant color, but it, it does change from white to, to yellow. Um, what, we, what we did was to align, well, first of all, we said we have to do nutrition training because you have to answer the question of, what did you do to my crop, you know? And so what we did was we first of all went to the Ministry of Health and said, what's the message that you're giving about vitamin A? Found that out. And then would have the conversation with farmers, which went something like this. Do you know about vitamin A? Yes. What do you know about vitamin A? I know this, this, and this. Ultimately, it was vitamin A, vitamin A is important for my kid, and I will take my kid to the health center to get the supplement. So then you say, do you see this sweet potato? It has a different color. It's orange. This has vitamin A in it, and you can grow this in your garden. And the number of times that I would watch women take this bit of information and think it through and think, well, wait, I'm, I'm already growing sweet potato. This is something that I can control. This is good for my kid. Bingo. It was so easy. The added thing was that when they grew them and fed them to their children, within three weeks, they would come back and say, you know what, my kid is better. I'm, I'm a long-term skeptic, having worked in, I grew up in Zambia and I have worked in Southern Africa and in Uganda for a long time. So I'm a real skeptic that people are gonna tell me what they think I want to know. But at some point, my skepticism had to be put aside because what I realized was I had women in different areas of Mozambique and different areas of Uganda saying exactly the same thing. And humbly, I had to say, mothers actually do know their children and they are seeing a difference. So that kind of, that kind of thing makes a difference. Okay, something else that we saw, the power of the group, that is not a, a surprise to you. It's also not a surprise to you if I say that all groups are not created equal. So Uganda has a long history of farmer groups and, and, and self-organizing. Mozambique, on the other hand, in 2006 was coming out of civil war and farmer groups were few and far between. The ones that were there were, were elite. And when we had to choose how to organize, we didn't have enough time to start the farmer group formation. And so what we chose to do was to take other pre-existing groups, which tended to be church groups. Um, there was a high level of distrust because of the war. So by taking the, the, far, the church groups, there might have been a little bit more trust, 
but because they were not organized around agriculture and nutrition, there was a trade-off. Um, that's not to say that they were not successful, but they weren't as easy to work with as uh, groups in Uganda, for example, that, that are in the groove of how to do it. Um, but we did observe across the board that farmer group members were more likely to adopt a new technology, like a new variety, than the non-farmer group members of, of the community, because of course that's what we played with. And as, as you say, I mean, you know, farmer group members are probably people that want to try new technologies. Um, but, um, you know, we, we do know that for an individual to make um, a choice to do something different, it will be easier if they are supported by a group. And I've certainly seen that in my other behavior change work in the wash sector where we trained um, pump menders, women as pump menders. They did far better if they were in a group than if they were trained individually and they didn't have the support. So, you know, identity, belief, expectations, uh, behavior as, as prescribed by the group, that all becomes very important. Quickly then, um, in, in terms of social, social learning, what we did and which has been described is, is sort of cascading training. We took an extension worker who trained um, a, far, a promoter who was chosen by the farmer group, not necessarily the farmer group leader, but chosen within the group. And then that, that promoter was to train the farmer group members. Initially, there were two people chosen, one who would get the agricultural training, one who would get the nutrition training. The agriculture promoter was often a man, sometimes a woman. The nutrition uh, promoter was almost exclusively a woman. And that is because nutrition is seen to be the, the area where women rule, and particularly around child feeding. But um, in the second iteration, where we lightened up the, the training, we asked the groups to choose one person who would get both agriculture training and nutrition training, and we asked them to consider getting a woman as, as, the, as the trainer there. Um, we found overall that the women performed better, uh, the extension workers for, performed better, and the promoters performed better um, if they were women. But as we've heard yesterday and again today, um, that may have been that women had to work a lot harder um, to be accepted. Um, and then my final thing that I would like to, to just tell you about is, um, in addition to the training that we did um, with the extension workers, with the, f the, f um, the promoters, we had local drama groups, and we also did mass media. And the really um, interesting part in Uganda was that we did a 30-episode radio drama um, called My Children. It was done in seven languages, put out in 10 um, radio stations, and it was so successful that it went on to a second episode or a second series of 27 um, episodes. And it was described, and I quote, a story of love, domestic strife, money, power, and of course, orange flesh, sweet potato. <laughs> so listeners were able to engage with the storyline by, um, by participating in polls uh, using SMS messaging. And we had more than 40,000 listeners putting out uh, 100,000 text messages in that first season. There's a whole bunch that can go in there. But I, but I want to tell you that the power of that radio drama was such that for two years in Uganda, the demand for the planting material outstripped supply season on season for two years. We could not have ever anticipated that. We had, we had worked very hard to make sure that there was seed throughout the country, um, but that demand was, was just crazy. And here's the thing, that when I started in 2006 in Uganda, there was no market for sweet potato vines. 
And when we did that radio drama in 2013, people were paying money for sweet potato vines. Now, if that's not behavior change, I don't know what is. Thank you. So, so let me open the floor, and, and yeah, let's let's sort of discuss some of the, the issues that have come up here, because I think they're, they're incredibly fascinating when we think about the future of extension. Floor is open. Anybody? We'll start with Frank, because Richard, you got the first go last time. <laughs> and again, introduce yourself. Hi, yeah, I'm Frank Place, the Director of Policies, Institutions, and Markets Program, based here at Ypres. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, drawing on some of the experiences we used to have at uh, ICRAF, we were, were quite a bit with volunteer farmers and, and trying to figure out who to communicate with in communities that could all pass on information to farmers. We had mixed successes, I, I would say. I think Steve's probably going to talk a little bit about some of the experiences we have in the next session. But, you know, the way we interacted with, or the project interacted with some of these lead farmers caused so, social upheavals in the villages in some cases in western Kenya. And it wasn't, you know, in the sense that they became kind of almost people that uh, looked like they were chosen, selected, and had benefits. And now we can't. Now we don't want to listen to them anymore in the village. So, I was just my question to all of you is like, what are your experiences with how we as external people actually interact with them to do to to avoid those kinds of situations? Yeah. Would you like to know this, Richard? Me? Okay. Um, so, you know, we've invested a lot in. Uh, Technologies targeting abiotic stress, uh, and then some of the, the nutrition work, like uh, like Harvest Plus. And I've always been interested in how do we promote uh, new varieties that have hidden traits. So, for example, high iron rice. Uh, a lot of the abiotic stresses. Okay, if you have a demonstration plot, there happens to be a drought that year. You, you might see visual. Uh, you know differences, but in the absence of that, what are the strategies for promoting things with hidden traits? That's Great. Um, one here, and then we'll go to the there. Uh, I I don't know if I got lost somewhere. How did you know uh, in the Uganda case that uh, this demand was because of the radio thing? Uh, because I, I understood you were doing other things. Seems to be good. Um, great questions. Um, uh, Frank, briefly on, on the lead farmers. Um, we, we took our lead from the implementing partners who were already close to, to their farmer groups. They already had um, uh, existing relationships with them and stayed away in the election process. 
So let, let the group really determine. We also did not provide any, um, the, the incentives that we provided were really about knowledge, maybe a t-shirt, but there was, no, there was no money. So it became more about a prestige of, I, I am blessed by working with this project and I have information. Um, and, and we didn't really see um, that separation, that upheaval that, that you're describing, although I think it could very well very well be. Um, Richard, uh, great question on the invisible traits. It's a, it's a, different, it's a different strategy. Um, but, but I'll tell you that when we started with the high iron beans in, in Uganda, the variety that we had was actually visually different from the beans that were known throughout the country. So for a little while, uh, we were actually able to piggyback on that. And, and farmers could say, oh yeah, that, that seed um, is unlike anything that I've grown before. But that's an intermediate strategy because in the end, what you're looking for is having all of the beans or all of the rice or all of the wheat um, with higher levels of zinc or iron. Um, and in which case, you just let it go through the system. Um, if it, 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 if it is mainstreamed, then it doesn't really matter. But for an intermediate, intermediate period, what we see is that um, the traceability becomes important because it becomes something that people like to market. So we've got sort of a short term, a medium term, and a long term um, thing that, that's in play there. Um, and, and I would say it's a, it's a little bit more messy than when you have a visual trait. Um, your question about how did we know that it was radio uh, that made a difference. So when we started, we were in three districts and then we expanded throughout the country. And in, in putting out through, so in, in the first project, um, choosing a radio station that was very close to the area so they wouldn't hear, uh, you know, the larger population would not hear about this. In the radio drama, this was 10 radio stations throughout the country, many different um, languages. And we were able to track with the, with the Vine multipliers who was contacting them because we were actually providing the names of, of um, the Vine multipliers to anybody that needed, needed to get them. So we, we did track that and knew that by that time our intervention at the ground was a lot less than in the first project. It was a lot less in the second project. And so that radio drama is what, what really kicked it into high gear. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just going back to this idea of kind of the lead farmers and, and the social upheaval threat, um, there definitely is, I think, one um, offset at the, at the front end, right, which is having the, the group nominate um, the, the people and, and kind of vouch for them and being very clear with them about what the program is. Um, that's quite different than, yeah, us kind of running a, a village census and then handpicking based on a model that we're running here. That, that for sure is, is quite different. Um, but even in the case where, you know, where we're running those models, leaving a little bit of wiggle room at the end for people then to do that nomination, even if it's just among one or two kind of candidates that we've put forward, and then on the back end, the idea of the incentives that we used was very much, um, you know, targeted at the individual disseminators, but then, you know, shared through like a celebration at the end of what the village had accomplished with some basically shared uh, incentives as well. Um, those are pretty, pretty light relative to everything else that we're offering that individual, but there is kind of this, this notion of, of broader gains. Um, I think those are kind of two useful ways. On, on the um, hidden traits idea, uh, what we're seeing basically is I think that the less observable the gains are or the costs are for each uh, potential technology, kind of the more learning looks complex. Like so the more you need to be getting this information from additional individuals and, and to some degree like the more mimicry kicks in, right? And the more people are doing it because their neighbors are doing it, they don't entirely know why, but you kind of reach a threshold number of neighbors that you need to reach basically to, to get adoption. Um, it's much harder to do it. 
And, and that's really actually quite related to this idea of, I think, kind of learning to be critical thinkers as, as um, kind of farmers or uh, as households. Um, you know, that's not, I would say, like, that, that's like a model of, of extension and learning, like, as education. Um, and we know that that works in much more complicated ways um, than learning about a particular technique at a time. Um, in, in um, you know, I, I think those are mostly kind of encouragements for the individuals to seek that learning, not just from their friends or neighbors, but but from higher sources, right? So it's the same reason, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging my neighbors to send their kids to college rather than, you know, necessarily to just interact with my kids who are going to tell them to go to college or not. Um, you know, I, I think there's kind of that, that um, appeal to once you reach a threshold amount of, of critical inquiry that, you know, it's, it's going to outstrip what we can do socially, essentially, through kind of informal volunteer efforts. Um, I'd like to respond to the sort of the concept of, of this lead farmer in our selection. One of the things we like to do always when we go in, uh, especially in, in interventions where we are selecting one farmer or a set of farmers to, uh, for example, in demonstration plots or things like that, where we are giving them something uh, and we expect there to be learnings or spillovers, is that we always make sure that we are going within the proper channels. And so we make sure that there is a government official on hand who can vouch for our credibility. We also try to make the process as transparent as possible, so especially like I'm, give, I'm going to give an example of demonstration plus because it's something we're doing currently. Uh, we take, vol we ask for farmers across the village to volunteer and then we pick randomly as, as much as possible in front of them for them to know that this wasn't, a, we're not preferring one farmer over the other. Uh, the other thing we do is that even though village is sort of the smallest recognized census unit, we, because we are familiar with how the social structure operates, we know that even within a village there are likely to be hamlets of, um, going back to my presentation, of like hamlets where there are only lower caste people, hamlets where there are only upper caste people. And in the past we found that if we do demonstrations on say a farm, a farm that's owned by a higher caste person or a lower caste person, we wouldn't be able to get other farmers to visit these because, the, you know, farmers typically because the caste system is such that people maintain ethnic and sort of rit sort of ritual distance, uh, and so we we try to pick out farmers from all of these different hamlets so that it's more representative and also because social boundaries don't become the constraint for farmers to learn from other farmers, and so those are some of the things we sort of try to keep in mind. You know. Great, great. Uh, maybe we can do one more round. Of which is, uh, really has, a, has a, a social status there. And if you go to Malawi, you also hear that the farmer, the other farmers around them are called follower farmers. <laughs> like they get in line behind the lead farmer. <laughs> it's a very, it can be a very hierarchical system. Farmer promoter is, a, is sort of a neutral term. You can think of it as one of the farmers who happens to be promoted. And then you, may, you used the term up there, uh, uh, farmer friends, I think. Yeah. Farmer friends? Mm -hmm. And is, is that what these farmers are called, these ones that you Increasingly, just mentioned? Yes. Yeah. So the, in the government terminology, they are now called farmer friends rather which is, than Which is the most friendly term. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 But the, the status is, is also important. We know that people learn better from uh, uh, people of their own or, or nearly their own mm -hmm. uh, peer group. And um, um, I think even the title and making sure to choose people that are that are either in the peer group or just maybe above, slightly above, could uh, probably make a difference. Excellent. Any other thoughts, comments, patience? <coughs> uh, there was also some shutdown under the National Culture Research Organization. Yes, uh, the National Culture Research Organization did some, some work on uh, orange fresh sweet potatoes, and um, they were using pupils in schools as a channel for in, uh, disseminating the technology. And we found it very interesting because <coughs> they, they used the school gardens at the same time teaching the pupils educating them about the importance of the orange flesh sweet potatoes. And uh, 
the pupils would take the veins home and encourage their parents to plant. And along the way, the demand for the veins became so high and outstripped the supply. But uh, of course, along when the project ended, there was no continuity. That's, those are some of the issues uh, 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 we find that some of these good um, uh, lessons that are drawn from these projects need to be replicated and, we need that, that, and that's why I say we need to find a system how do you get all these good because when I listen to her also you, you find there are good lessons that are coming out of these research projects but the, the, the ability of getting this sustainability of this after these and getting things continue is why I'm always finding a problem. Anyone want to speak to that sort of scaling from, from pilots and research and, and experiences? I, I mean, I, I know, Ariel, especially uh, some of the work that we, you did in Malawi and that Pasadena Dupas is doing in Malawi to, to figure out, you know, to compare sort of horse races between, mm. you know, who's the best person in the network to identify and then, and then train were, were really interesting. But practically, right? Looking for those proxies, as you said, uh, to 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 identify the best people in the network, and then scale that up to like a national program. I would imagine would be just mind-bogglingly difficult. Um, and, and likewise with orange flesh sweet potato. I know there have been starts and stops with a lot of that work. Um, and in India, hundreds of starts and stops, let's say, and hundreds of experiments always going on, often across purposes. I mean, how do you get from like really good evidence to, to scale? And, and, and not to say that we're not doing that, I think actually a lot of things, like what Muslim's talking about, are at scale. Yeah. Um, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't fail to recognize that some of these things are bigger than, we, than, than just a small research project now. But uh, any thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I fairly advertised before that I would not recommend doing you know, in-depth social network censuses mm -hmm. and large scale, for sure. Um, and that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think our first pass was like, let's find proxies, right? Like easy to observe correlates of social network position, right? But I think what we're learning is, is that it actually, this operates at, at kind of higher, like more meta levels, right? So this clustering idea doesn't necessarily depend on measuring the social network super well. It doesn't depend <coughs> on this idea that you want to pick people who maybe know each other. Like a, a simple proxy might just be literally, you know, what is the nature of the relationship between the two people you're training in this village? Are they gonna are they likely to interact with the same other people so that they hit them again with the same kind of messages? There there are some of these kind of takeaways that, that are I think are a little bit more practical. Um, you know, that being said, I mean I think the other lesson really is that that the different you know, there's lots of heterogeneity in the way people are learning also in that population, right? And, and some people are going to be easier to reach than others. Um, and we can compensate for that, I think, to some degree by also making sure that, you know, some people are going to be pretty quick to take it up. And then there's going to be the, that more marginalized population that does require either incentives for those initial disseminators or other kind of ways to reach them with multiple signals maybe some hard information like pamphlets or, or you know, other kind of uh, easy you know, visual aids, all of those kind of tools that we have are going to be targeted at that kind of last, I would say, quarter to a third of the population that isn't going to be recipient. Those are practical things. Okay, so with the, with the sweet potato, our end goal is to saturate the country with vines. But along the way, that's that's actually um, it's tricky because when we started, if people didn't tend their vines and they lost their seed, they lost their seed. There was no other source. True. So this um, that initial project led to this social network um, uh, study, which then led to the next one, which was okay. What do we need to do to ensure that the crop stays in a community? And what's the saturation level that we need to look at? Um, and in the end, it was if 50% of people in the in the in the community have the binds, it's going to be there. It's going to stay. And so that's our long-term goal: is to ensure that there's a a big network of seed suppliers through the country, 
so that people lose, they can they can get them from a neighbor or they can buy them. Um, and and we know that not everybody will adopt, but there will be enough. <coughs> and so we will not have to worry so much that the project finishes with school kids. But I, I just want to tell the group that uh, kudos to Uganda. They have a World Bank project that works with both sweet potato and, and beans using schools and, and health centers getting into, and getting the crops into the communities. And I think that that is extraordinary. So I think that the country is well on its way <coughs> to having saturation levels. In fact, I think we would be hard pressed right now to find a place in the country that doesn't have orange flush sweet potato, unless of course the conditions are such that they cannot grow them. You know, in some areas of Katamoja just too dry. But I think that the saturation level um, is, is quite significant. Great, and Muslim, you have the last word before we go for coffee. Yeah, so as David mentioned, I mean, one of the things we like to do is not set up new institutions in our intervention, but leverage already existing institutions. So I think that's one thing that really helps you do projects at scale. And so when we're working with self-help groups, for example, we are working with self-help groups that are set up either under a government program or under a large sort of civil society-led initiative. Um, and so that's one of the things, I guess, that you can do to make sure that your interventions are done at, at scale, is to leverage already existing institutions, sort of trying to set up new ones and building from scratch. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you all very much for the questions and the discussion. And thanks to the panel for uh, their insights.